Hey, Friendly Neighborhood Immunologist here, and today's video is a requested video about a deep dive into apolipoprotein 2, otherwise known as APOE2. So this video might be for you if you're interested in Alzheimer's disease research or on living to be over 100, being a centenarian. This paper is a research paper published in multiple groups across the US and Japan, Duke University, uh, the Mayo Clinic, as well as Georgetown University. So a lot of star-studded research going into this paper. They explore both human data and rodent data. So let's take a look. All right, let's deep dive into apolipoprotein E2 specifically, but I'm gonna go over all three of them briefly in the beginning. So APOE2 is potentially exciting because it is found in centenarians and it is found to be protective during Alzheimer's disease. So here we have APOE2, which is found in only about 5% of the population. APOE3, the vast majority of us have one, if not two copies. And then APOE4 is about 20% of the population. So here I've color coded them APOE2 in green, APOE3 in blue, and APOE4 in red. Now, if you were a researcher and you wanted to find apolipoprotein, you would be looking at chromosome 19. And what you would find is a glycoprotein, meaning a protein with a sugar attached. And it's about 299 amino acids long. And the only thing that really matters here is that there are two variants, and even though they're 299 amino acids long, they only are changed in one to two of these 299 amino acids, which is kind of amazing. And even though there's only one to two changes, there are these large effects that can be seen because APOE4 is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. All right, so there are two parts to these proteins. The beginning of the protein is called the N-terminal receptor and it binds to actually receptors. And I'll tell you what they are on the next page. Well, next slide. The C-terminal is what binds to the lipids. So here I'm drawing for you APOE2. There's two locations that are important, amino acid 112 and amino acid 158. They both are cysteine molecules and they actually are very good at binding to each other. APOE3 has a cysteine at position 112 and an arginine at position 158. That's it. That's the only difference between APOE2 and 3. APOE4 has an arginine at both positions, and this actually makes it behave quite differently, and I'll tell you more about that in just a minute. So let's look at APOE2 here in green in action. In the body, APOE2 is primarily made by the liver, and then in the brain, it's primarily made by immune cells, which is why it's something I have studied. So microglia and astrocytes, the immune cells of the brain, primarily make your APOE for you. Um, and they don't really intermix. The liver APOE and the brain APOE don't intermix because of the blood-brain barrier. So they really are lipid carriers, and they primarily carry cholesterol and they remove cholesterol from the brain. Okay, so I'm drawing for you what happens when multiple APOEs combine. They can carry lots of lipid together. All right. So off to the right-hand side, you have a microglia, and it's gonna interact with the APOE2 at these three different receptors. There's one in blue, orange, and purple, and they're going to have different actions but primarily they're going to have actions on the way your brain processes lipids. So people who have the APOE2 genotype actually have lower levels of total cholesterol and higher HDL, which is the high density, the good kind, but you also have higher triglycerides and that's not great. So having APOE2 isn't completely perfect. Okay, so here, the top receptor, I'm about to draw the names for you they are basically to do with cholesterol. So there is the uh, low density lipoprotein receptor and the very low density lipoprotein receptor. And what that means is APOE2 can collect the cholesterol and other lipids around your body and then take them to the microglia. So two things can happen. 
um, either this triggers the uptake of ApoE and the microglia will then break down the triglycerides or it'll activate a signaling cascade. So you can see here in number three, the TREM2 receptor, it's possible that binding here would activate a signaling cascade. So TREM2 is involved in the uptake and breakdown of dead cells, as well as breaking down amyloid beta. So TREM2 could be a potential tie-in to how ApoE2 is beneficial for Alzheimer's disease. All right, so let's take a look at some data. What you're seeing here is people aged 60 to 110, and then the percentage on the y-axis off to the left side is between 0 and 100%. Now, the, what it's saying is that these people are free from Alzheimer's disease. So if you look at APOE 2-2, meaning you got a copy of 2 from your mom and your dad, which is very rare, like I said, 5%, and then you can see that even at 110 years old, 80% of these people, 90% of these people are free from Alzheimer's disease. But if you look at people with the APOE4 genotype, you can see that even around 80 to 90 years of age, only 25% of people are free from Alzheimer's disease. And this is very interesting for researchers and medical doctors and could potentially help design cures for Alzheimer's disease. So the paper I was asked to look into was studying APOE2 independently of Alzheimer's disease. They wanted to know if APOE2 could affect longevity. So they looked at approximately 24,000 people. They adjusted for sex, age, race, and Alzheimer's disease, and they wanted to see how long they would live. So this isn't as dramatic as the previous figure I showed you, which was looking at people free from dementia and Alzheimer's. This is basically how long did they live? And uh, you can see that in blue, there are people who have APOE2, and then in green, it's APOE3, and red, it's APOE4. So they kind of messed with my coloring, but that's all right. You can see that people who are APOE2 and 3 uh, live considerably longer than people who have APOE4 genotype. So the next piece of data is something called a hazard ratio. And what that means, it's measuring one group compared to another, and they're measuring the survival. If the survival rate was one, then there would be no difference between group one and group two. If the survival ratio is below one, then that group is surviving. If the number is closer to two, then that group is more at risk, more of a hazard of dying. So then if you look at the top, it's comparing APOE4 to APOE3. So you can see here that regardless of whether or not people have Alzheimer's disease, the no AD group and the AD group, both of those people, if they had APOE4, were more at risk to die. And if you look at the bottom panel, they're comparing APOE2 to APOE3. And you can see here, regardless of whether or not the people have Alzheimer's or not, the people with APOE2 are going to survive longer, they're going to be less at risk for dying. So why is that? That's what the investigators and researchers wanted to find out. So then the researchers wanted to see what would happen in an animal model, what would happen in mice. Mice actually only have one type of APOE, they don't have three types. So the researchers did something where they basically added they added the APOE that they were interested in. So they added APOE2 to one group, APOE3 to another, and APOE4 to another group. And what they observed was how long did these animals live? And the answer is the group that had APOE2 lived on average 911 days. That's actually a really long time for a mouse to live. They typically live about two years. And then APOE3 animals lived 825 days on average, and then APOE4 lived about 753 days. So this survival experiment done in animals reflected the same phenomenon seen in humans. So then the answer was, why? Why would these animals be living longer than others? And the researchers thought maybe it has to do with activity. So they looked at a number of activity-based tests. And what they saw was that in the blue bar at the APOE2 animals, they typically moved a lot more than any of the other animal types. 
and you can even see, uh, let's see, let's take a look. C is showing you what an OFA is. That's a fancy term for open field assay, which really means the animals get to run around in a box for a certain period of time. And the ApoE2 animals ran around the most. They also, there's something called reared in mice. When they go up on their hind legs, it's very physically demanding for them. And they did that a lot more in the ApoE2 group, which the researchers thought was a good sign for activity and energy levels. And the researchers did perform statistics. You can see in panel D, E, and F that they ran statistics between ApoE2 and all of the other groups. And anytime you see stars, it means that it's significantly different, which means that the difference probably didn't happen by chance. It's probably a real, observable, important biological phenomenon. So one star is good, and two stars is fantastic, and four stars is really quite significantly different between the groups. So ApoE2 animals really were significantly more uh, active than ApoE3 or 4. All right, so after the exercise was performed, the researchers wanted to look at how much cholesterol was in the brains of these mice based on what type of APOE they had. So here you can see in panel I, they were comparing cholesterol between the different groups. They're still color-coded as before. Blue is APOE2, green is three, and E is four. And what they did over in J is a better visual comparison you can see that in the rightmost section towards the bottom, there are blue dots, meaning that ApoE2 has the least amount of cholesterol. And then as you follow the line to the left, you can see ApoE3 in green, ApoE4 in red. And the purple is actually a knockout, meaning that the purple animals have no apolipoprotein at all. So in addition to having low levels of cholesterol, the ApoE2 animals have high amounts of HDL. So this graph looks pretty much like the opposite of the previous graph, where the blue dots in panel M, they're all the way off to the top of the right side. And then the green dots, as you'd expect, are in the middle, but this time E4, ApoE4, is sort of interspersed in the middle as well. So you can see that basically the presence of any apolipoprotein was beneficial here, and then in the purple group with no APOE at all, they're doing pretty poorly and have very low HDL. So the last lipid the researchers looked for in the brains of these animals was the triglycerides. Now I did mention earlier that although people with apolipoprotein E2 have low cholesterol, they typically have high triglycerides, at least a percentage of them do. And you can see here that that's true in the animals as well. The ApoE2 animals have the highest triglyceride levels in the blue bar. It's much taller than any of the other blue bars, and it's got all of those stars for significance. You can also see it in panel O, how the blue dots are in the highest right position compared to the purple, green, or red dots. So what that says is, Apolipoprotein E2 is increasing the survivability of the animals. It's also increasing the amount of exercise they're performing. It's hard to say, you know, chicken and the egg there, um, but between those two things, low cholesterol, higher levels of activity, as well as increased survival, could mean that apolipoprotein E2 is linked to longevity through exercise and lipid metabolism. All right, so what could all of this mean thinking about it at a larger level? This is a summary figure from a research paper. I'm gonna put the link to this paper as well as the paper about longevity in the description box. So there's a lot going on here. I'll try to unpack it for you a little bit. There's uh, a neuron at the bottom. There's a microglia at the top. There is the blood-brain barrier off to the right-hand side. And the take-home here is that there's a number of ways that apolipoprotein E2 is going to affect the brain. We've talked a lot about lipid metabolism, and I think that the researchers proved that there is a difference in humans and animals when apolipoprotein E2 is there, and that it does increase survival in humans as well as mice. 
Now, the researchers also mentioned that neuroinflammation could be a big deal, uh, but what they did when they looked at neuroinflammation in this paper, the data was called negative data, meaning they didn't find anything, but they did include it in the supplemental figures. I took a look at it. It's just a table um, with numbers on it. And when I looked at the numbers, I agreed. Um, they didn't find any in differences in neuroinflammation. They measured a couple of different cytokines as well as microglia and astrocyte markers. Didn't see anything. But during Alzheimer's disease, the interaction between ApoE2 and microglia could be important. And they're showing that towards the top when they're saying amyloid beta clearance and they've got that question mark near ApoE2. They are showing that amyloid beta clearance is best in the ApoE2 genotype and that potentially degrading amyloid beta is also best in the ApoE2 genotype. But there are a lot of question marks there because it's been suggestion, suggested but not completely proven. All right, um, ApoE2 is also more likely to help neurons function and they do that at the synapse. They're showing that at the bottom in green, the bottom right, synaptic plasticity. That means that the neurons can fire action potentials, file signals in your brain and recover from those signals well. Uh, basically, it means the communications between the neurons is, is optimal. They're also showing in the neurons something called neurofibrillary tangles at the bottom and that the least amount is present in people who have the apolipoprotein E2. So that's another benefit there. One of the only detriments that they are showing here, and it's basically that people with apolipoprotein E2, remember I said they have triglyceride issues? Well, they also have cerebral amyloid uh, angiopathy issues. And they're showing that on the blood-brain barrier, um, approximately two-thirds the way down. And what it means is that amyloid beta is not likely to form a plaque. It's the least likely to form a plaque because it's probably getting cleared from the brain. But it could start to build up along the blood-brain barrier, which can cause its own set of issues. So apolipoprotein E2 is beneficial in most, but not all circumstances. It does behave a little bit differently when made in the body versus being made in the brain. But overall, it does seem to be increased or uh, related to longevity. All right, that's it for the APOE deep dive. Please let me know if you have any additional questions in the comments section. I'm going to try to keep to a video a week, but now that I'm back to teaching full time, it is pretty difficult. Uh, yeah, and until then, stay healthy. Bye.